summarized it so well is, uh, you can have a seat, Anna. Um, you can stop looking at me like I'm crazy. But anyway, Anna was moved on her heart, I don't know, a couple months ago, and she did these little sticky notes. And she put a sticky note on my mirror, and it said, Dad, I love you. And then she put a sticky note on Angie's mirror that said, Mom, where would we, I don't I'm going to probably butcher it, but where would we be without you? Uh, you are raising two kids. That, the second kid would be me. And I couldn't agree with her more. So, I mean, that's like the way the importance of a mother is in our own house. Of course, my mother, I would probably be dead right now if it wasn't for her prayers. But anyway, happy Mother's Day to everyone. Um, thank God um, the Lord put a special word on Angie's heart. She's going to share for the mothers. And so I want to invite her up to share that right now. I'm glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. It's good to be here today. I've missed y'all. So um, nice to see everyone to, today. Um, I would just wanted to share something that's on my heart that pertains to, I don't think it just pertains to mothers. Um, everyone can apply this to themselves. But um, the, it was a few weeks ago, the Lord really quickened to me um, from Proverbs 31, how the woman looks well to the ways of her home. Um, and he was challenging me in, in some things. Um, and I flashed back to Ken years ago, and, and I believe Noel, where they really hit on the reality um, of Israel. They, they knew the acts of the Lord, but they didn't know the ways of the Lord. And just that pressing in to us, coming into the very ways of the Lord um, the necessity of that, especially as forerunners um, in, our, in our call um, to prepare people for the Lord's return, is that we have to know the ways of the Lord. But then, you know, I was thinking about that, but then transferring it just to our everyday life in the home that the Lord wants us not to look just to the laundry to the grocery shopping, <laughs> to all the many tasks that we do. As Proverbs 31, wives, we do not eat the bread of idleness. I love that scripture. I feel like that is, that so describes motherhood. We do not eat the bread of idleness, but we are always busy. But in the midst of our busyness, the Lord really wants us to be figuring out what is his way and what is going on in our homes. You know, we have those moments where we have hiccups in our home. Things are, are this is my, my house? I don't know. You might have perfect homes, but, you know, there's dynamics and personalities. I'll just hit on, I'll just pick that one to, to hit on is when we have our conflicts and our personalities in our homes, it's not about us trying to necessarily fix everything to just bring peace at that moment, but the Lord's allowing those times of different personalities to bring us into his ways. And that's where we're dying to ourself and where we're instructing our kids, our stronger will kids will instruct one way, and our more passive kids that want to retreat from conflict, we need to push them into the conflict and you know how to deal with it and not take rejection from everything. But it's about the Lord really wanting us to get into his very ways in the midst of whatever we're dealing with in our homes. So don't just get caught up in the laundry and the dishes and all the, the vacuuming, the many things that we have to do, you know, or we don't always have to, but really get into looking for the ways of the Lord at that moment, at that day. Um, you know, for some, when you're the young ones, when they're so little and there's no sleep, you know, it's the dying to, you're realizing your strength is just going, you know, it's not your natural strength, it's the coming of the Lord's strength. As they get older and their personalities, you know, conflict with one another, it's that instruction time of taking just those little moments to push them into the ways of the Lord, into teaching salvation initially, and then discipling them through those moments. Or like I think of Donna, Sue, Diane, how y'all intercede and y'all birth now. You have grown kids, but you're still birthing. Um, you're still looking, maybe it's not the way to your home per se, but you're looking to the way of this home in your birthing. So just for all the women, but this applies to men too, let's look to the ways 
of the Lord in the midst of uh, what the Lord's allowing into our lives. So. Now, was that me? No. Okay. Okay. Oh, Just oh sure. wait. Just I do have I'm one other kidding. thing. For the, <laughs> for the younger um, adults, women, girls, young ladies, study Proverbs 31. It's a great, great chapter of Scripture to really study and understand. Amen. You can take that yeah. down and turn it off. So thank you for that awesome word. So anyway, so I want to continue. Turn, if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Philippians chapter 3. And uh, I want to continue in this message we've been looking at. It's just something the Lord's really highlighting to us. And we have been focused on the great reset God wants to bring into the church. We've looked at Hosea chapter 6 and seeing that God has torn us, but he will heal us and he will raise us up after two days and that we may know that we may go on and press on to know the Lord. That's Hosea chapter 6. And then we said last Sunday, this is actually the continuation of last week's message that Paul, I believe, um, I think you can make a good case for this, was when he was in house arrest in Rome, was likely very inspired by this passage in Hosea chapter 6. And so Paul is really wanting to hit on, and we talked about this last Sunday, that he really wants to hit on this whole idea of pressing on to know the Lord. And so... Uh, Philippians chapter 3, we looked at. I'm going to read just a, a few passages here. It's uh, starting in verse 7. But what it, Paul's saying, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And we hit on that last Sunday, that if we want to gain more of Christ, there are certain things that need to die. There are certain things that we need to surrender. There are certain things that are blocking and hindering the full release of Christ in our lives. Verse 8, uh, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, Paul was saying Jesus is better than and you can fill in the blank. Jesus is better than anything or anyone you could ever imagine. I think part of our problem in this whole thing is we don't really have a vision of the grandeur and the majesty and the splendor of who Jesus Christ is. We know him as Jesus of Nazareth. We know him as the broken man on the cross or the babe birth in Bethlehem. But we don't know him as the transcendent King of kings and Lord of lords in Revelation. And Paul is saying to us that, that we may know him, we may know the superior treasure of knowing him. And Paul goes on. This is not just knowing facts about him. It's not just knowing Bible stories about him. It's not being able to quote scripture verses. It's not being able to just have this intelligence about him. It's an experiential, deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. See, you have not been called to know about Jesus. You have been called to know him. To know him intimately. To know him deeply. To know him experientially. And that's what Paul is getting at here in Philippians chapter 3. He's saying that we may know him. He's better than, he's superior than anyone or anything you could imagine. And he says... For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish. Now, we were, if you were here last week, the kids are in the, in, the, in, the, in the service today, so you'll like this if the kids usually drift off when I talk. But that word actually means poop, animal manure. So I'm getting some thumbs up from some kids. They were all of a sudden zoned out, but now they're zoning in. They like to talk about poop. I don't know why. I guess I, sometimes Angie would probably say, yeah, you, you urge them on in that. Yep, that's true. But they like poopy talk. Here's poopy talk. Paul is basically saying everything that you could ever, the best you could ever experience in this life is like horse manure compared to the supremacy and the superiority and the completely better than Jesus that he wants to give you. He is far better than anything you could fathom or you could imagine. And Paul says, I count him but rubbish. I count him but manure. I count him but poop so that I may gain Christ. 
This is amazing. I want you to get this. Paul, at the end of his life, about two, two years or so before he's about, I don't know exactly, he's about to face death. It's a few years before he's about to face death. Paul, the great apostle, he's written much of the New Testament by this point. He has planted churches. He's moved in mighty miracles. He's seen the risen Christ. He has been to heaven. He was at an out-of-body experience and taken it into, into the third heaven by this time. Paul is telling us there is more of Christ that you can gain. That's stunning. That's amazing. Paul is telling us, listen, there is more of Christ that you can gain. And I said this last Sunday. It just came out of my mouth. I, it had to be the Lord because I hadn't thought about this is the measure of Christ you have is the measure of Christ you want. I heard some groanings last week. It's true. It's convicting. <laughs> the measure of Jesus Christ you have in your life is the measure you want. I think I'm going to do a whole message about that because it's, there's so much layers to that. I'm not going to go into that today, but I just want to say Paul is telling us you can gain more of Christ. I can gain more of Christ. Let there be a hunger in us. Let there be a thirst in us to say we've got to have more of this person, not the things of God, but the God of all things. Paul goes on and he, in verse 9, he says, That I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which comes by faith in, in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Stunning again is Paul at the end of his life has not moved away from the glorious doctrine of justification by faith. This, this, this is not just like some doctrine where we just graduate from a couple years after we start this journey. No, Paul at the end of his life, after everything he's seen, he said, I don't want my own righteousness. I want the righteousness that comes by faith. He never deviated from that. And we hit on that last Sunday, is legalism trying to do things so God will like you, trying to do things to earn God's love, earn God's favor, earn God's approval, to, to, you know, to make God do things in your life. If you pray more, read more, fast more, witness more, go on mission trips more, give more. Now, you can give more. That's okay. But the thing is, is this. The thing is, is this. If you're still striving... To gain God's love and approval, you have not yet known the doctrine, or the beautiful, it's even more than a doctrine, but the beautiful truth that God looks at you and he says you are justified, you are righteous because of Jesus Christ. That frees you from legalism. That frees you from the yoke of legalism, of always trying to spin the wheel so God likes you, so God loves you, and you move into this place Instead of doing things for God to gain approval, to gain love, to gain favor, is you move now from this place of having love, having favor, and acting out of that rather than for it. Huge transition. So that's what we looked at last, last Sunday. But now, coming into verse 10, Paul is saying, I love this, Paul is saying that, that I may know him. Speaking of Mother's Day, I think my mom prayed for this, this verse for me for many years, didn't you? I believe you did. You told me that. Yeah, you did because you told me. So moms, you can pray this verse for your kids. I pray that they would have a desire to know me, to know, not me, but know the Lord and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship. So, so the brief, all the suffering we've been going through is because of my mom's prayer. So that I would know the cross and the suffering and the death. Okay, so thank you, mom, for that. No, I'm kidding. But, but, but you can pray this for your kids, that they would have this singleness of vision and passion to know the Lord. That's what Paul's saying here. I've come to this place where I've said that, the, that doing things for God, there's more than that. I've got to come into this experiential, deep, personal relationship with a person. I've got to know this man. I've got to know him experientially. And he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. It's, this is a power that's, great, that's not just power for miracles. 
It's power for an exchange life. It's power to live not by your own self-life, but by the life of God, the indestructible resurrection life of Jesus Christ, divine life. You have been invited into the most glorious exchange you could ever imagine of giving him your self-life in exchange for his resurrection, indestructible life, the life of God. How incredible is that? And so anyway, Paul's saying this, this is number six, we, we, we look at 11 lessons that Paul taught us from Philippians 3. This is, we did five last Sunday. We're going to pick up with number six now is, is knowing Christ also means experiential identification with him in his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Here's what I want to say is that knowing God, we, we think knowing God only means we go into our nice little quiet time, we have a latte in hand with that latte art with a heart because Jesus loves you, and we've got instrumental music flowing in the background, and may, maybe there's a fire in the fireplace, and we're singing our love songs to Jesus, and he's singing back to us in this intimate time of communion and fellowship. Now, don't get me wrong, there is, I don't really have latte art when I drink coffee, but anyway... I don't really even use instrumental music, but you get the point. There is that in our times with the Lord, for sure. No doubt about it. There's no doubt about that, for sure. There is those sweet times of intimate communion with him. But Paul is saying here in verse 10, is that if I want to know him, then I've got to be identified with the cross. See, we like it when Jesus, me and Jesus, in the secret place is nice, we love it, but we don't really want to die. We, don't, we want to preserve our self-life, don't we? We don't want to feel the pain of the cross. We don't want to feel the pain of the Lord doing a deep work in the cross. And so we just kind of like, okay, Lord, you do that, I'll stay here. And then, you know, we don't want to experience that kind of thing. But Paul's telling us, if you really want to know the Lord... If you really want to know the Lord, then it's the cross being identified with him in his death, in his, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. What I want to, what I want to say is this, as we, get, as we dive into this a little bit deeper, is this whole issue of identity. Identity. And it's a huge issue in our culture. Massive issue in our culture is... The, and, and Paul talked about this, the things that define you. You know, you could be, your identity could be rooted in a million things. The way you look, the, how much money you make, how many friends you have, what kind of possessions you have, your education, your scriptural knowledge, you know, how, many, how much influence you have, the impact you have, how many, your kids, and, you know, finding our identity in our kids. And, and there, there's so many things that we have in our life that identify us and shape us to form our identity. Paul was telling us, and we looked at this last Sunday, Paul was telling us, my identity used to be in being in my Jewish roots. My identity used to be in how much of the law I obeyed, how zealous I was to persecute the church, how my, my heritage being from the root, and the, from the uh, tribe of Benjamin. He was saying, I, I, all those things define me, but Paul was saying, I came to this realization that if I want more of Jesus Christ, I've got to lose those things that define me and be found in him. And I believe, you know, for us, there's so many things we try to get our self-worth from, our self-esteem from, our self-confidence from. We try to get it from the way we look. We try to get it from the, the amount of money we make. We try to get it by our accomplishments, our intelligence, our, our kids, our, our, our material possessions, whatever it is. I mean, there's a whole list of things we could do to try to shape and find our identity. And Paul called it, confidence in the flesh. Well, here's the problem. When you're trying to find confidence in the flesh, whether it's by how you look or how much money you make or this or that, whether you're, when you're trying to find confidence in the flesh, it will either lead you to pride or it will lead you to low self-esteem. I think that it will lead either one way or the other. 
And Paul's telling us you can't find your identity in things. Because those things, when you try to find your identity in things, it will block you. It will block you from gaining more of Jesus Christ. See, I want you to think about just for a second. Ask yourself the question, what is it that shapes my identity? Okay, and don't give the Sunday school answer because most of us aren't, I mean, really are not like Paul. No, it's Jesus Christ and his cross. That's probably not true for most of us. What really is it that shaped your identity? Is it how smart you are? Is it how you look? Is it how much money you make? Is it your friends, your education, your, your knowledge? What is it that you put confidence in the flesh and that in itself shapes your identity? It's so, it's so important when you're younger. I had a flashback this morning when I was preparing and I thought, oh God, I used to struggle with this big time when I was in high school. I remember from about, thir I don't know, 14, so now the kids are paying attention, so that's good. Uh, and even the air conditioning stopped, so that's good. So you're, now you're really paying attention. When I was about 14, my identity was so much in how I looked. And I, you know, I wanted to be this surfer dude with you know, tan and long hair. And you know, I worked out all the time. And my whole identity was just shaped up in the way I looked and my body. I mean, you look at me now and you think, okay, that's, that's a long time ago. Yeah, it's a, it is a long time ago. Why are you laughing? So it is a long time ago. I mean, it really is a long, long time ago. And then I remember in high school, it was pretty much my whole high, jun, sophomore, junior, and senior year was so much into this, how I looked and my body and, you know, this and that and my looks and my appearance and all this stuff. And I remember I, I, when, I get, when I got into college, I said I had this radical recommitment to the Lord and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just rededicating everything to him. And I just went to the entire different extreme. I just said, I don't care what I look like. And I remember I used to go to college, literally would dress in college. I, was, I had a uniform that I would wear almost every day. I had sweatpants and I wore this light blue t-shirt with a number two on the back. And the number two was like peeling off. I mean, it was coming off. So if you looked at me, you could see my back. And I wore this red hat and I was like, I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I look like. I went to the entire different extreme, but I was still trying to find my identity in the way I looked or whatever. And so, you know, so many of us are trying to find our identity in our appearance and our identity in the way we look, our identity, even in our kids. We can, you know, some, you know, we get, when we grow older, it, it, it's so easy to say, okay, well, you know, my life really wasn't successful, so I'm going to find my identity in my kids' accomplishments and and how much my kids do. I mean, I think dads do that a lot with sports is, okay, I wasn't a very good baseball player, so I'll drive my kid to be a good baseball player and drive him and drive and drive him. So I'm finding my identity in their accomplishments. I mean, what is it really that we are pushing for that we're trying to find our identity in? Now you add to this mix, you add to this mix social media and oh my goodness, it has just gotten so out of control. If you haven't realized this, friends, social media is not reality. It's not reality. I'll never remember, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never forget, a couple years ago I was talking to John and John, my brother John and Heather and their family, they went, to, I don't know, I think they went to the lake. I think it was the last time John posted anything on Instagram, but went to the lake and there was like this, I mean, it came right out of a magazine. I mean, it looked like the kids are laughing and like, it looks like, it was like straight out of a magazine. I was like, John, it looked like y'all had an awesome time. And John was like, well, actually, that was about the, it was about a 30 second window we had when the kids weren't constantly complaining and crying. And that just, that was like, hit me. I was like, okay, social media is not reality. But it really takes this whole thing of identity and blows it up to so many people to think, okay, your identity is in the image you portray on social media. Your identity is now in the number of likes you get. Your identity is how many people commented on your post or how many people shared it or whatever. Listen, if we want to truly have an unshakable identity, it is found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in our things. And that's the advice Paul is telling us. Paul is telling us, okay, listen, guys, 
I, I struggled with this too. Look, if you struggle with this, if you, whatever, it's, yours is different than mine because you're not Jewish. But for me, I struggled with this. This is what Paul would say. I put my, my confidence in things. I put my confidence in my Jewish roots. I put my confidence in how zealous I was to obey the law. And he's saying, listen, I came to this realization that if I want to gain Christ, I've got to lose all of that. I've got to lose it all. I cannot find my identity in things. I cannot find it in anything but only in a person. I think God wants to bring a shift to us where our identity and our image is no longer found in things, accomplishments, achievements, money, friendships, influence, appearance. I mean, whatever, the, whatever it is for you. Paul is telling us that, that your real identity is in the person of Jesus Christ and that you have been called to be identified with him in your own experiential, uh, your own experience of his cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. See, God wants to bring us into this identification with the risen Savior. God wants to bring us into this identification that we would know him, we would know Christ by the power of this cross life working within us. So we've, we've kind of gotten into the church today where we don't like to talk about the cross because the cross means death and we don't want to die. But I want to say, listen, I've gotten to the point where I've tasted of the resurrection life of Christ. If you die, you get to experience resurrection life. It's far better than your own self-life. I assure you, far better than your own miserable self-life. You're not even happy anyway. So why would you want to still stay alive? I don't get that. God wants to crucify your self-life so his life can spring forth out of you. Watchman Nee talked about this, and he said... It's not so much, God is not interested in good versus evil. God's not interested in what's right versus wrong. God's interested in what source does it come from. And so what God wants to do, what he wants to do is he wants to, see when we're talking about the death of the self-life, we're talking about self as the source of living that comes in your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. See, what the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to come and bring the cross to your soul, to your self-life. I'm telling you, this is good news. This is not bad news. It's only good news if you love yourself more than Jesus. But it is good news. He wants to bring the cross to your self-life so that the source of your living is now no longer you. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, he said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is now no longer I who live. In other words, Paul was saying, I'm no longer living from the self-life and the soul. He says, now I'm living by another's life. I'm living by the indestructible life. I'm living by the resurrection life. I'm living by the life of God. He had come to this place of the exchange life to realize I'm now no longer living for myself. I'm no longer living by my own strength and power. But one who dwells in me, Christ dwells in me. The indestructible resurrection life of Jesus Christ, he now lives inside of me. And because he now lives inside of me, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God wants to bring us into that. That is not good, or not, that is not bad news. That's good news. God wants to bring us into this place of the death of self. So that we would live by another life, the power of Jesus Christ. The only way we get his life, which by the way is resurrection life, is through death. I don't mean physical death of your body. I mean the death of self, the dying of self where you no longer live, you are no longer the source of life 
in your soul. It's now coming from another entirely different source. And for that to happen, self has to die. Self has to be crucified. It's getting quiet in here. This sounds like bad news. If it sounds like bad news, it means you love yourself too much, to be honest. And you haven't tasted the superior pleasure of God in his life. You taste one bit of his life and you're like, I don't want to live in my self-life any longer. I want to live by the power of Christ. I want to live by the power of another one, of him who dwells in me. Amen. You still there? Paul was telling us in Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I, you know, I quoted it a minute ago, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's now Christ who lives in me. In the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That was uh, in the book of Galatians. About eight years later, Paul in Philippians 3 is telling us, oh, I have just barely tapped into this journey. That was, you know, eight years ago I was here. Now I'm like, oh, I want to experience this. I want to experience this deeper. I want to know his, his cross working in my self-life. I want to know even the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed into his death. Not that because, it's not because Paul loved pain. That's not what he's saying. He says, no, I want to live by the power of his resurrection. Man, that's what I want to live by. And I say that for myself. That's what I want to live by, the power of his resurrection. It, this, is, this is more than just uh, power for miracles, power for gifts, power for healing. I believe it would include that, but it's power. It's the power of God that he talked about in Ephesians chapter 3, where he says that the, the power of Christ would strengthen your inner man so that Christ could dwell in your heart by faith. This is all about the power of Christ coming in so that you would become a dwelling place of God in the Spirit internally, not just in a small measure, but in fullness. I want that. I want that so bad. I should say I want him so bad. Not the external. I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I like the external. But even more than the external, this internal knowing of Jesus. So Paul goes through and he talks about the he talks about the fellowship of his sufferings. This is where we all of us kind of tune out and say, okay, I don't really want to hear this part. The fellowship of his sufferings. Now, this word fellowship is the word koinonia in the Greek, and it means fellowship, communion, intimacy, joint participation. I just want to be clear, though, as we talk about the fellowship of his sufferings from Philippians 3, that this fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus Christ is not, does not, Paul does not mean embracing a sickness, a disease, or a disability as a gift from God. Nor does this, the fellowship of his sufferings, mean in living in poverty or lack. Okay, Paul does not mean any of that when he says the fellowship of his sufferings. Sometimes, Sometimes we're living in these, these, this place of suffering, but it has nothing to do with the sufferings of Christ. It has nothing to do with it. Sometimes a lot of it's just a, our own why, unwise decisions we've made. Sometimes it's spiritual warfare. Sometimes it's just the fall, and we say we're in the fellowship of his sufferings, and God's like, not really. <laughs> That's your own dumb decisions you've made, and you're reaping the fruit of it. Okay? The fellowship of his sufferings, so when Paul says the fellowship of his sufferings, he's not talking about, I want to take pleasure in suffering in and of itself. Paul's not saying that at all, that I want to take pleasure in suffering. That's not what Paul is saying. So what Paul, and, and the other thing I would say about this is I would never, ever advise you or counsel you to pray, God, let me know the fellowship of your sufferings. Let me, let me suffer. Listen, I found that if you really follow Jesus Christ wholeheartedly, you'll have plenty of suffering, <laughs> all right? I mean, you, when you start following Jesus Christ wholeheartedly, you will put a target on your chest for the enemy, and you will have plenty of suffering. It will not, you will not lack in suffering. So don't pray for suffering. What, you know, what Paul is telling us, he, now get this in mind, Paul's writing this under house arrest in Rome. 
Paul is writing this as one who has been persecuted for the gospel. Paul is writing this knowing that he's about to face death. That's the suffering he's talking about is that, is that I am going to follow Jesus Christ wholeheartedly and if I experience persecution on that journey, then what he's saying is in that persecution, I want to have fellowship not with the suffering, but with Christ in the suffering. Does that make sense? See, what I'm saying here is this is that when we are going through suffering, is we can know Jesus in that suffering. And we can come to an experiential revelation of him in that suffering, unlike anything we've ever known. So if you're going through a time of suffering, listen, press into God in that place because you can know him unlike any other time you can know him. I've heard so many people that, that like I went through this trial and when I was going through this trial, I was just like, God, it's horrible, it's terrible. But I came to this place of knowing the Lord so intimately that when he finally brought, brought the breakthrough, I was like, oh, Lord, I don't even want the breakthrough because the experience of intimacy was so incredible. So I want to encourage you, if you're going through any type of suffering right now, in that suffering, press into him by gold refined by fire, like Jesus said in, to the church of Laodicea, buy gold refined by fire because in that time, in that gold refined by fire, you can become rich. Don't run from the suffering. See, I believe the Lord is, is even saying to the American church, do you love me enough to enter into the fellowship of my sufferings. Ask yourself, for real, for real, take an honest inventory of your own heart. Do you love Jesus enough to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings, or do you want just your nice little quiet times with him, you and Jesus alone? Because what the Lord, and the Lord's not interested in bringing pain into your life, the Lord is interested in you coming into full identification with Jesus on the cross. Full identification with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. That is what the Lord is after. That is what the Lord is, is looking for, is do you love me more than you love yourself? See, I believe that you can, you can see it in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon it, it, besides being just a natural love story between Solomon and the Shulamite, it's actually an allegory of Christ and his church, Christ and his bride. It's in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, we see the bride, and she's just lovesick for Jesus, and she's having her lattes in the quiet place with instrumental music and fire in the fireplace, and it's so incredible. And God loves her, and she loves Jesus, and it's just this incredible exchange of intimacy and communion and fellowship. And she's like, this is awesome. This is incredible. He's so awesome. And then Jesus comes and says to her, I want to bring you into the cross. And I'm paraphrasing. I want to bring you into the cross. I want to bring you into spiritual warfare. I want to bring you into conflict and battle. I want to train you as a warrior. And she's like, yeah, I didn't really sign up for that. So no thank you. And she says in Song of Solomon, turn my beloved and go away. She resisted the deeper work of the cross. She, see, what it was is she was more interested in her inheritance in Christ than she was in his inheritance in her. She said, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. She was so focused on what she could get out of the relationship rather than becoming his inheritance. I'm telling you, the Lord wants to bring a shift into the church where we no longer live for our inheritance in Christ. And I, I, listen, I love our, my inheritance in Christ, and I want to live in my inheritance in Christ, but I, that's not the primary focus of my life. I want to become the inheritance of Christ. I want to say, like she said in Song of Solomon 5, come in, my beloved, and basically make my heart your garden. Come in, my beloved, and have me conquer every part of my inner man. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to get to is, Lord, I don't want to live for my own self-interest. 
See, the bride in Song of Solomon chapter 2, the bride, she had, listen, she had a heart after God. But she did not yet have a heart after God's heart. And there's a difference. There's a difference in that. See, we can be a person who has a heart after God and we love him. But usually what that means is we like the way we feel when we get near him. We like that joy we get by experiencing him. We love that, that feeling that comes by revelation. We like, we like the way he blesses us. We like what he does for us. We like getting you know, insight. We like hearing his voice. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But there comes a time when the Lord's like, okay, listen, it's not just about you. It's not just about you. I'm calling you into the deeper work of the cross. I'm calling you to where you would no longer live for your inheritance, your, inher my, your inheritance in me. I'm calling you to become my inheritance in you, where you live for me and I, and I come and fill you and I possess you internally. And so the bride said, yeah, I'm not really there right now. Why don't you, Jesus, go out and do those things you like to do with all that spiritual warfare stuff and all the conflict and the trials and the opposition? You go do that. I'm going to wait right here in my quiet times with Jesus where the, where the instrument, instrumental music is going. I'm just going to wait right here, and then when you're done, come back and I'll be here. And she says, and she said, the Lord, she says to the Lord, turn, my beloved, and go away. Then in Song of Solomon chapter 3, she experiences the Lord's discipline. She experiences separation from the Lord's presence. And she comes to realize what she had done is she had said no to the deeper work of the cross. She had said no thank you to Jesus when he said, come my beloved, I'm bringing you into the deeper work of the cross. And she said no. And the Lord withdrew. And the Lord said, okay, I'm going to bring you into a season of dryness and discipline until you learn the necessity that what I'm trying to do in you is not just have you and Jesus quiet times. I'm bringing you into the experience where you can become fully identified with me in the cross, in the crucifixion, in the burial, in the death, and the resurrection. Because I'm bringing you into this place of spiritual union where your self-life dies because I am going to fill you with my indestructible life. And so now I want you to turn to Song of Solomon. Everyone still there? Song of Solomon chapter, Song of Solomon chapter 4. After she comes out of this discipline... After she comes out of the season of discipline, she's like, okay, Lord, I learned my lesson. You're after way more than quiet times with me. Listen, if you don't have a quiet time, you need one. I'm not saying that. You really need one. It's the most important thing we do. But she says in, in Song of Solomon 4, 6, she says, she makes a vow and she says, until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. In other words, putting the allegory together, the symbolism together, what she's saying is I'm going to go and I'm going to embrace the cross. I'm going to embrace the cross, Jesus. I am not going to resist the deeper work you want to bring into me. I am not going to resist the work of crucifixion you want to bring into my soul. I say, yes, Lord, come in and do what you want. I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. I will go to the cross. Now, if you notice here in the language, it's actually really stunning. In Song of Solomon, it's the first time after the bride, after this maiden, after the maiden, after the maiden says, I'm going to go my way to the cross. The very first time she's called his bride. Verse 8, a one, one, couple of verses down. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. And then if you look in uh, four, chapter 4, 8 through 12 and 5, 1, after she says yes to the cross, allegorically speaking, the Lord calls her bride six times. 
But before that, he had never called her bride. See, if we're going to become that bride who makes herself ready, the cross is unavoidable. Unavoidable. Amen? There's no other way to become prepared as the glorious bride of Jesus Christ apart from the cross, apart from the crucifixion of self, apart from the death of self, apart from the fellowship of his sufferings, apart from the resurrection and being resurrected into union with him, apart from that. There is no other way for the bride to be made ready. The bride cannot just be made ready in her quiet times. The cross has to work for her to be made ready. And once she says, I will go my way, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh, I will embrace the cross, I will embrace whatever it takes to have you. I am after you, Lord. I'm not after my own self-life, my own self-interest. And so once she makes that decision, you see the, the dramatic shift when she's no longer focused on her inheritance in Christ, she's now focused on his inheritance in her. When I was praying for this message, I, I felt like the Lord just spoke to me and said, there's some who are listening to this message that whether motivated by fear or selfishness, have resisted the deeper work of the cross, and there has been a feeling of stagnation in your relationship with the Lord, that if you feel dry, disconnected, and spiritually dead, it might mean you are, you are resisting the work of the cross. Like this maiden, you may have put your hand up and said no to Jesus when he was trying to crucify your self-life. But I believe the Lord's word to you is that if you will repent and acknowledge that you have, in fact, said no when he wanted to bring you deeper into that work of crucifixion, that you would no longer resist the cross or run from it, is that you will experience times of refreshing that would come from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Don't resist the cross. Don't resist the cross. The next thing I felt like when I was praying about this, the Lord wanted me to share, is that there is coming to the American church a measure that we have not known of the fellowship of his sufferings. And I, I felt like the Lord was saying to me, the church has to be prepared for persecution. We have not known persecution. But we've got to be ready for persecution in whatever form it comes in. And we know if we've followed what's going on in the world, we've gone mad. The world has gone crazy. But I believe the Lord is going to use this craziness going on to bring the church into a measure of the fellowship of his sufferings. So I believe the Lord was just prompting me to say, prepare for persecution. However it comes. Now, we don't seek out persecution, but the Lord is going to use some persecution in this nation to separate the true from the false and to prepare the remnant, of the, the remnant as the bride of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay. Now, we're moving on to point seven. Everyone says, amen, finally. Whew. Only got 11 points, so four more. I'm going to try to move through these fast. <laughs> People are like, uh, you do realize today's Mother's Day. I'm just going to say this, number seven. Number seven is maturity is measured by the measure of Christ in you. And I've got scriptures that go into this, but I'll, I'm just going to say this. Maturity is measured by by the measure of Christ in you. Maturity is not measured by your intellectual knowledge. Maturity is not measured by your outward things you do. Maturity is not measured by your anointing or your gifting or your talent or how many people you know or how many people you impact. Maturity is measured by the measure of Christ that is you possess inwardly and internally. So I'm just going to say that just to move on. Number eight, pursue Christ like he pursued you. See, Paul was basically telling us, listen, I press on to know him. 
I press on to know him. I'm pressing through the obstacles. I'm pressing through the difficulty. I'm chasing after him. Listen, Jesus came and he pursued me. He chased after me, so I in, in turn am going to chase after him. God would, would want us to, God would want to move on our heart to say in the same way I have pursued you, now would you pursue me in that same way. Number nine is reorient your life around the one thing of utmost importance. Paul said in Philippians 3.13, he said, I don't regard myself as having a, a laid hold of this yet. He said, but one thing I do. I want you to catch that right there. One thing. Paul basically said, I am, I'm simplifying my life down to one thing that I am pursuing. I am after one thing right now. I'm after Christ. I'm after pursuing Christ. I, and and, he, and he, um, he basically, under house arrest, said, I am recalibrating my life around one thing. I, I'm, I'm reorienting my life around one thing. As we come out of the season we've just been in in 2020, I just want to say to us, let's become a people of one thing. Let's become a people of one thing. Mary of Bethany was a person of one thing. She said, one thing, the Lord said to her, one thing that you have chosen. You have chosen to sit at my feet. You have chosen intimacy with me. You have chosen to get to know me. That one thing is not going to be taken away from you, Mary. Be a person of one thing like Mary. Be a person of one thing like David. David said, oh, that I would be able to behold the beauty of the Lord and meditate in his temple to gaze on him. David was a man of one thing who wanted this, inter wanted this uh, holy of holy relationship with, with the Lord himself. Become a person of one thing who says, I am laying down everything because I want to press in to know him. That's what Paul did at the end of his life. I believe that's what Paul would exhort us to do in this time and season we find ourselves in. Amen. Number 10. Forget the past and press forward into the future. Paul said in Philippians 3.13, he says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as, laying, as having laid hold of it yet. Talking about all that we've talked about, these mindsets that we've talked about. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I reach forward to what lies ahead. Paul was telling us, if you want to know the Lord, if you want to press in to know the Lord, if you really want to know him, if you want to have all that Paul has described, Paul is telling us, listen, you've got to let go of your past. The Lord really highlighted this one to me as well when I was praying about this. Some of us keep going back to our past a past hurt, a past wound, bitterness, unforgiveness, something that happened to us, a regret, hope deferred. We keep going back to, well, I made this mistake. Okay, maybe you did make the mistake. I acted unwisely here. Okay, well, maybe you did, unact, maybe you did act unwisely here. But we just keep thinking about the past and going back to the past and going back to the past and back to the past. And I believe the Lord would free some of us today and would say to us, the past is the past. Let go of the past. Forget the past. Forget the disappointment. Forget what happened to you. Forget the pain you experienced. Life is way too short for you to wallow around in this condition. Forget the past. The past is past. And press in to know the Lord. Let go of regret. Let go of disappointment. Let go of your life. Maybe it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to be or wherever you are in life right now is not really what you planned or the way you envisioned it is actually different than what you thought. Let go of those things because now it's time to seek the Lord. 
Hosea said, Hosea said, break up the fallow ground because now it's time to seek the Lord. Some of the fallow ground is some of that hardened area in our hearts that because of bitterness, because of pain, because of regret, because of unforgiveness, because of rejection, because of disappointment that we're holding on to and we keep going back to it. It keeps drawing us and we keep, even though people are saying to us, stop going back to the past, we just keep gravitating towards that past, to that regret, that pain, that disappointment. God wants to free you from the shackles of that today. Amen. Today, I, I'm just declaring this over you if you're struggling in this area. Today is a new beginning for you. Today is a new day for you. This is a new day for you. This is a new season in your life. You said, well, it's never going to change. And the Lord says, it's changing right now. You said, it's always going to be this way. I'm always going to feel this way. I'm always going to walk around feeling as if I'm, you know, discouraged or depressed or heavy. And the Lord's saying, the, the change happens right now. Right now, the change happens this moment. Your new day is beginning right now. See, we thought, no, well, I regret and I, I did this and I made this unwise decision. And we keep playing it in our minds over and over and over and over and over and over. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have done this. If I would have done this, it would have been different. The Lord says, it's over. I'm bringing you into a new season and I can restore whatever has been taken from you. Amen? God is bringing you into restoration. God is bringing you into a new day, a new season. It's a reset for you. It's a new season for you. It's a new day for you. God's doing a new thing in your life. God is doing a new thing in your life. This is what I wrote down, what I believe the Lord said to me when I was praying about this. For those who keep looking back at their past, rather than looking forward into their future in Christ, this is a new day for you. If you will trust God and rely on his grace to let go of your past, you will begin to experience a new day, a new season, a restart in your life. The Lord will give you grace to no longer remember the days of old. Amen. Amen. Paul said, I'm pressing on to one thing, but if I'm going to press on to this one thing we've talked about, I've got to let go of the past and I've got to reach forward into the future. Number 11, this will be the last one. And I'm just going to say this really quick. Paul makes it very clear in verses uh, thir or 15 through 16 that those who are mature, those who are mature, he says, I'll just read it. He says, let us therefore... As many as are perfect, that actually means mature. It means mature. It doesn't mean you have to do everything right. Those who are mature in Christ have this attitude. That word attitude actually means mindset. So in other words, everything Paul has just described, these 10 things we've just looked at, Paul is saying that if you really are mature in Jesus Christ, that these mindsets, these mindsets need to be yours because maturity is not defined in our intellect and in our knowledge and all that we have and all that we do and our gifting, our talents, our resources, our connections. Maturity is, is measured by Christ in you. He's saying, if you have this, let all who are mature have this mindset and if anything you have a different mindset, God is going to reveal it to you. So as we close, I just want to encourage you let this part one and part two be more than a sermon you hear. Let it be mindsets that you internalize so they become your own. Something more than just a sermon you hear and say good, bad, whatever, amen or not amen, whatever that is, something you move beyond those things to where you internalize and they become mindsets that shape you, that drive you. Because that really is what defines maturity. That really is what maturity in Christ is all about. So I just want to say this. Make a decision today to no longer be a child, 
but begin a journey towards mature sonship by developing these 11 or these 10, 11 mindsets that Paul laid out. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Father, for your presence, your anointing that's here. Lord, we just ask you right now for just that you would take this message, Lord, and you would multiply it into our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.